title is Behavioral Ecology of Tamelia gall aphids Induction, Cohabitation, and Freeloading. And those are a few themes um, that I've explored over some years now working on this system um, that is centered very much, especially in the west slope of the Sierra. And I borrowed the term freeloading, um, just making in reference to a, a popular culture image here. Uh, my mom and I used to watch this show called The Red Skelton Show. Some of you might remember it. I think one of the roles Red Skelton played was as Freddy the Freeloader. So there definitely is freeloading going on in the insect world, if I may borrow that expression. So I have a little background information I wanna to offer to put this into some kind of context. And starting with parasitism, probably the word parasitism conjures images or sensations of ticks drawing blood from a large vertebrate host, or maybe a mistletoe situated on an ash tree, uh, drawing water from its host. Uh, but there are other kinds of parasitism in which one species exploits another, such as brood parasitism or social parasitism. And this slide uh, shows, I guess famously, the young cuckoo, which is actually a brood parasite. That is, it exploits the parental care of its host species, the reed warbler. The bird on the right, the small bird, that's probably one fifth the size of the parasite, is the hardworking reed warbler host. And brood parasitism, has been well studied in the um, avian world especially, but it goes on in other kinds of fauna, including insects. Social parasitism implies exploitation of social behaviors of insects, commonly the ants and the wasps and the bees and their elaborate parental cares as they're exploited by some species that invites itself to the table. For example, this tiny beetle here, a myrmecophilus or ant-loving, socially parasitic inquiline beetle, Paramyrmides fovea penis, for example. And this brings another term you may or may not be familiar with, inquilinism. And really an inquiline means a dweller. I think inquilino in Italian just means somebody who lives in a house or an apartment. Common example that springs to mind probably is the case of the California tiger salamander, which doesn't dig its own burrow for estivation during the hot, dry summer, but instead depends on ground squirrel burrows. So it acts as an inquiline or it invites itself in to that domicile and so benefits from it. And in the case of this beetle, it's highly specialized towards exploiting the ant's social behaviors on which it depends. So this is another important theme in my research. Another theme, or if you like the study subject, is that of aphids, small soft-bodied insects that annoy many people. There are many species. They're famous or infamous for undergoing clonal reproduction. Uh, I liken this form of reproduction to the, what I call a Matryoshka doll syndrome. And people who play with these dolls understand that you'll have a larger doll who contains a smaller doll, who contains a smaller doll within her, and you can play with these and pull them apart. Uh, many countries, not just Russia, have such uh, playthings. And so with aphids, because they undergo what's called parthenogenesis or virgin birth or asexual reproduction, unusual among animals, a female may have her daughters within her and those daughters are within the daughters. So the granddaughters are actually nested within a female aphid. And this can help explain how their numbers can explode so quickly on your favorite tomatoes in your garden, for example. Aphids, I think, are also remarkable for undergoing parthenogenesis on a cyclical basis. Uh, that is to say that during the growing season, they'll go through a series of asexual generations and then at the end of that growing season, they'll finish with one sexual generation. And that's why we call it cyclical. So they actually are shaking up the genetic deck of cards on an annual basis, but during the growing season, they put out as many individual animals as they possibly can. So aphids are probably infamous also 
for having complex life cycles that are not easy to figure out, as I discovered um, when I started my PhD thesis work. And this is over 25 years ago. And maybe I have no imagination, but I've continued to work on this system for that whole time. And this system involves galls, which is yet another area, I think, quite interesting um, in natural history. I assume we have many natural historians present in our audience. What are galls? Well, in California, the kids will pick them up and throw them, call them galls, oak galls, and they'll scratch them on the sidewalk, play with these kinds of things. Galls are quite remarkable because they're organized um, tumors that occur especially on plants. So I'm talking about plant galls. And here's a very common example in California. Sometimes these are called oak apples. And they're actually caused or initiated by a tiny wasp larva, many times smaller than the gall itself. So the animal actually tricks the plant. It alters the plant developmental program, probably through um, the use of hormones or hormone analogs to produce this perversion of tissue a neoplasm or a gall that benefits the insect, but not the host plant. Galls are very diverse, they're very numerous, they're relatively collectible. That's actually nice for ecological work. You can collect them like berries from a bush and take them home to the lab and examine them under a microscope. So you have a very well-defined system and you can decide what's inside the gall and what's outside the gall quite readily. And so this photo is of a cynipid wasp gall or galls on Quercus douglasii. A few more words about aphids. Aphids may be regarded uh, broadly as having some fairly simple social behaviors, sometimes more elaborate. And these seem to be associated with galls or plant galls in the minority of aphid species. So I wanna say among those aphid species that induce galls and live within them, most of them may be thought of as solitary because the females have created a defensible and highly valuable resource and they will defend it and they will not share it with other females. There are a few cases where there are highly social forms um, that have actually evolved a soldier caste. So I have a photo here of Serrata vacuna japonica, a Japanese species that's considered eusocial or highly social because one of the morphs or forms of the aphid clone is actually a soldier that defends the gall against natural enemies. Yet another form of sociality in gall aphids is the one I'm looking at here. And these are Tamelia aphids. And I refer to them as communal because they may share their galls with other females, which is quite unusual. I have some slides of the outsides and the insides of galls to get you more oriented again to the system. I suppose many of you have seen these galls or maybe collected them or wondered about them if you spend time um, anywhere really in the Sierra or most of California. You'll see manzanitas or their relatives and they'll often have these galls on the edges of leaves. So in this photo, which I took on Santa Cruz Island, this is of uh, leaves that are caused, that are, have galls caused by Tamelia aphids on Arctostaphylos insularis, or the island manzanita. And sometimes they seem to produce this anthocyanin pigment, which makes them bright red. So they're relatively obvious on the landscape. They may be the size of a dried kidney bean. Most of the work I'll talk about is situated at Chico State's Big Chico Creek Ecological Reserve, which essentially is a swath of canyon, Big Chico Creek Canyon upstream from Chico's Bidwell Park. It's about 1600 hectares, and it's this whole stretch up and down the canyon of this, this watershed here. And here's a photo of one of the two species of manzanitas. I've studied Arctostaphylos manzanita, blooming right this time of year, January. Now fires happen, we all know this. <laughs> we are dealing with them as best we can. They're part of management, conservation concerns. Um, this particular fire, which happened at the reserve was called the Altatina fire. And it's actually not a very big one, 24 hectares. 
But I regard this as a kind of natural experiment, meaning that the environment has been changed, um, not because of a manipulation, according to some experimental plan, but just because of an accident. And now um, conditions are such that ecological succession can proceed and we can study it. And that's what I do. And Jeff, you mentioned that in your, in your introduction. And that's part of my story is ecological succession. So this is the aftermath of the fire. And you can see the soil is mineralized and the shrubs here are pretty much just charred sticks. Well, other fires have happened in the reserve. Uh, there was a series of fires following 300 dry lightning strikes, I guess, in 1999, which is shortly before I arrived in Chico. And these fires raced up and down the canyon and they scorched um, many places in the canyon of Forest and Chaparral. At my field site, which is about one hectare in area, maybe 450 mature manzanita plants survived. So the fire didn't simply bulldoze through and wipe everything out, no. It seemed to jump around. It was very erratic, which I suppose is typical of fires. At the same time, it seemed to prepare the soil and promote the germination of what seems to be a single cohort of 140 new plants. Now, I figured this out uh, not long after I arrived at Chico State, that there had been a fire and that there probably existed a single cohort of young plants, all of them stimulated to germinate because of the smoke and the heat associated with the fire. So that's a fairly convenient fact. And that's what I mean by natural experiment. I did not light the match to start the fire. Lightning did it, but there it is, and it can be studied. On the left is the Arctostaphylos manzanita or common manzanita. On the right, Arctostaphylos visita. And in Nevada County, I'm sure you can see Arctostaphylos visita um, various places in Foothill Belt. By the year 2008, I realized that the very first galls appeared on the young plants, which were now eight years old. They germinated in 2000, they were eight years old. They first began to sustain aphid galls by that time. And this provided an opportunity to track them in time and space and uh, record when those galls first appeared and on which plants. Here's a close up of just one of these galls, again on the common manzanita induced by the aphid Tamelia cohenii, about the size of a kidney bean. If you were to open up these galls, you may see the gall inducer, Tamelia cohenii, shown here on the left, and you may see in about 10% of the galls an inquiline, Tamelia inquilina, a species I described back in 2000. It turns out it makes a living entirely dependent on the gall-inducing species, and they're closely related. Here are a couple of photos that one of my students took using scanning electron micrograph technology. And these are close-ups of the mouth parts, the specialized mouth parts of these aphids for tapping into the phloem, the plant sap, for food, but also for inducing galls, which is a very subtle business. Here's a photo of adults, and things have changed. Um, by adulthood, the inquiline, rather than being slight and small and slender, is actually relatively large and heavily armored or sclerotized and quite woolly. Looks a little bit more like a werewolf. So the Tamelia inquilina is above, and the gall-inducing species, Tamelia cohenii, in this unretouched photo, is below, and they're sharing a gall. And as far as I know, there are never any fights between these two species, even though the inquiline is strictly a parasite. So a few remarks um, along general lines about evolution and ecology of these aphids. There's some patterns that I've observed and explored over the years. Among them are co-speciation of gall-inducing and inquiline aphids, which follow loosely or roughly the lines of diversification of their host plants. In the subfamily are Butii, which includes Manzanitas, Arctostaphylos, but also Madrones, Arbutus, 
and summer holly, Comoristaphylis. I've studied um, dozens of populations and most of them show this shacking up or communal behavior on the part of females. Sorry, I think of that as facultative communal behavior. They don't need to do it, but they commonly do it and they tolerate one another, which is remarkable in itself. The question of whether they might be eusocial is an interesting one. I have some tantalizing evidence that there might be a soldier-like cast in one Sierra Nevada population in El Dorado County. Uh, so this is one of the genera on which these aphids induce galls. Um, one I discovered, Comoristaphylis, um, also known as summer holly, and it lives um, on Santa Cruz Island, other uh, Channel Islands, as well as the immediate coast near Santa Barbara, but it's limited to Southern California and Northwestern Mexico. Here are two females shacking up and sharing gall space in a gall on Comaristaphylis diversifolia and the offspring as well. I have a few uh, research questions I'd like to share with you that I've explored with students. One of them being, um, what is the effect or consequence of sharing galls on the fitness of these aphids? So to explore this, I devised these little clip cages from very modest components like foam, aluminum, plastic uh, tube, and then a little hair clip and put it all together with a kind of silicone cement. And then I would clip these over galls to contain whatever was inside those galls when it came out. So I could get some numbers and I could get some data. Here's one of the things I found is that as a function of the number of females or foundresses sharing a gall, a uh, survivorship varies, okay? So on a total survivorship basis, the number of, of survivors within these galls climbs overall, but per capita it declines. So it seems as though these females do worse when they're sharing gall space in terms of their survival than when they're on their own. So under these terms, these communal, communal associations may be regarded as altruism or selfless behavior by the first female inducing a gall. If she is joined by another female, that female may be thought of as acting selfishly. Could this be altruism or selfless behavior with passive kin selection? It's possible. It's possible that kinship plays a role and I have more information on that question. But in any event, it does not seem to qualify as cooperation because collectively they're not gaining more than they would have if they'd induced their own galls. So this partly answers the question, but not completely. I had a student get interested in this question about kinship um, and he found a way to actually um, specify kinship among these females within these galls and I'll share you those details. But what motivated him was to, to explore the question of whether kinship relatedness actually helped or facilitated communal galling behavior, sharing galls among females. Did kinship have anything to do with it? Uh, this is the paper that he published, we published from his master's thesis, High Mean Relatedness Among Communally Galling Tamilia Aphids. And this is revealed by a molecular marker that's called an amplified fragment length polymorphism, that's a mouthful. Basically, it's a signature or it's a DNA fingerprint. It's a kind of technique that can be used to separate kin from non-kin. And we published it in this journal for the study of social arthropods. And this just shows you the high degree of variability among aphid clones for different combinations of tools we call primers for exploring how much variation there is. And the answer seems to be there's quite a bit of variation among these clones. So they seem to be useful for separating kin from non-kin. If they were all the same, they would be quite useless. And here's the essence of Brian Taylor's results. Um, these box plots show what's known as the genetic distance between animals um, that we examined. And genetic distance would vary from zero, 
meaning that they're genetically identical, all the way to one, meaning that they're completely unrelated, essentially. So for pairs of animals that were collected from different galls on different plants, Brian Taylor showed that they had this level of genetic distance. They were not very close. But from animals that were collected from the same gall or intragall pairs of aphids, there was a significantly closer genetic distance. The upshot is that they're quite likely to have been kin or even clone mates overall. And that's what I write here. Possibly kinship does facilitate communal behavior because about half the time, those animals sharing galls are also sharing their genomes. So gall mates appear to be clone mates. It's basically the toss of a coin. It doesn't mean they can tell one another apart. It does mean they're likely to be clone mates. On to this question about whether this group may have some interesting um, eusocial behaviors. I found that these uh, larvae, these young aphids, come in two very distinct forms. I call this a dimorphic larva. And these two animals came from the same female, and they're clone mates of her. So I know they're closely related, very, very closely related, because I reared them from the same female. And by far the commonest one, I call a typical gall-inducing morph, which is about half a millimeter long, very tiny, with relatively short and small legs and antennae. This other morph, this alternative morph, I'm calling a soldierly morph. It has relatively large legs, large antennae. It also has a very nervous habit of running around rapidly. I don't know what's behind this. I wanna learn more about these sorts of things. Uh, you could draw a parallel if you like, um, using California's governors, a uh, typical morph on the left, Gavin Newsom looking a little tired and, and his voice has been very scratchily lately, I suppose. And then the governor before he was governor, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm using him to represent the soldierly morph. The point is that these morphs are very different from one another and the soldierly morph, I don't understand yet, but it might have some very interesting breaking and entering kinds of behaviors that it does. So there's much more to be found out with this group. Here's a um, synopsis, if you like, of the life history that a student of mine, Clara Buchholz, prepared. It's somewhat simplified, but I'll just walk through it um, to orient you a little bit more to this group of, I think, very interesting animals. Usually around ma March at, at lower elevations, the first females or stem mothers emerge from overwintering eggs. Notice that they're uh, wingless. They also are asexual and they are capable of inducing galls. So they'll induce a gall on, the, on an expanding leaf, and within that hollow gall, they'll develop and they'll reproduce clonally, and then they'll generate winged daughters, clone mates of themselves, but they don't look like their mother. Instead, they have wings, they have relatively long legs and well-developed sense organs. So there's an alternation between a sedentary phase that moves very little, and then an aerial phase that moves quite a bit. And this next generation undertakes an effort to find more host plant tissue suitable for gall induction. And if they do, they put down live larvae, larva position of another round of gall inducing females who look a lot like their grandmothers, quite frankly. And they induce another round of galls later in the growing season, say by June at moderate elevations. And toward the end of the growing season, which tends to be July, the end of these asexual generations is reached. And now the final generation, asexual generation of males, they appear for the first time, and then sexual females appear as well. And these pair, and the females oviposit eggs, which pass the summer and much of the winter in crevices at the base of the host plant. So this is essentially a summary of the complex life cycle of the gall-inducing species. But layered closely on top of that, the inquiline species is tracking at the same time, the timing of the appearance of these galls. And the inquiline invites itself into these galls, both when they appear in April, but also when they appear in June.
Here I try to summarize various options for Tamalia wingless females or morphs. Now as gall inducers, they may undertake founding their own gall, or again, they may join other foundresses in established gall. So we might call the ones who found the galls producers, but the inquilines are obliged to act as obligate parasites. They cannot induce a gall. I explored this experimentally. They simply die. You might think of them as scroungers. So they're exploiting the producers' resources. Inquilines may either inv invade new galls, but they can also invade mature galls. Again, I've never seen them fight, and I've looked at tens of thousands of galls. They just seem to get along. They're laid back California aphids, but the inquilines are not nice to their hosts. I want to emphasize that. The data I have here um, show that pretty well. I try to compare the number of adult offspring produced from these galls, depending on whether the galls had only foundresses or gall inducers within, or whether galls had foundresses as well as inquilines. And the number of adult offspring produced was pretty close, but when inquilines were present, they produced the lion's share of the offspring by about three or four to one. So when they're present, they grow up faster and they outreproduce their hosts somehow. So they're not nice to their hosts. Uh, this third uh, category here is galls that happen to have inquilines only, which I don't think, frankly, are too important here. All right, I've done some um, molecular phylogenetic work with colleagues to explore the question about the origins of these inquilines in Tamalia aphids. And I have some results. Uh, it happens that gall inducers and the inquilines together collectively form what's called a monophyletic group. So they have a single origin and it includes all of the descendants from a common ancestor. The inquilines themselves, like very bad members of the family, are derived from gall inducing ancestors. So it seems as though they've lost the ability to induce galls. And now they're completely dependent on their gall inducing closely related hosts. Here's another thing that was surprising with a colleague. Uh, we found that their molecular clock or the rate at which their mitochondrial DNA um, turns over or replaces base pairs in its sequences, this is over two and a half times faster in inquilines than in gall inducers, which is quite striking. So the inquilines essentially are evolving much more rapidly than the gall inducers for unknown reasons. And this is called a tree or a phylogenetic tree um, that looks closely at these aphids and the patterns that emerge of branching over time. It's called a Bayesian tree that refers to a, a probabilistic way of constructing the tree. And I'm not going to give you all the details, but let's just say that both nuclear DNA, but also Buchnera, which is an aphid uh, symbiont, and um, the DNA of that Buchnera were used to construct this tree. So let me just go through this uh, briefly, not to get too bogged down, but when you're establishing or constructing a phylogenetic tree, it's important to have an outgroup or something you're comparing it to to anchor it. And so we use the P aphid, which actually has had its genome fully sequenced. This is a, a pest species. All right, so that's the most distantly related group. Now, um, the next group, next most distantly related seems to be Tamelia, undescribed species on Arbutus or Madrone and Chromorostaphylos or Summer Holly. And there's another undescribed species that is restricted to the Southern California species, Arctostaphylos glauca or big berry manzanita. It seems to be its own entity as well. And then another group to branch off that forms its own entire clade or larger branch here are the inquilines. There appear to be a number of species of these inquilines. For the moment, I'm gonna call them a species complex but they too have radiated after they diverged from a common ancestor. And then finally, this last bit here are 
gall-inducing Tamelia species on other kinds of manzanitas. So this is something we have in hand. There's much, much more that can be done, but it gives you a sense of the diversity and complexity of this group on their host plants. I have here a, a photograph of an undescribed or new species. Uh, want to name it Tamelia glaucensis because it causes galls on Arctostaphylos glauca. And this photo was taken at San Marcos Pass in the Santa Ynez Mountains above Santa Barbara. Sometimes my students doodle. Uh, I'm sure Jeff Lauder never did that ever, but they'll doodle in, in class, maybe rather than paying attention. And I had a wonderful student, Trevor Moore, a few years back um, who doodled. And one day I actually looked at what he was doing and it was amazingly good. Uh, so I approached him, I said, would you like to illustrate um, uh, species descriptions of new galls, Tamelia gall inducing species as part of a publication? And he said, yeah, and this is his work and I think it's really very, very good. These are uh, his drawings of galls on Arxostaphylos glauca, a branchlet, here's a close up of a gall from two different angles. All right, a couple of other themes I, I want to explore concern dispersal and diversification. And I suspect that the mode of dispersal, the rate of dispersal, and the scale of dispersal, how these animals move, may have some bearing on their relative rates of evolution over time. I think they vary between gall inducing and inquiline species as well. So, part of my ongoing project. Uh, at Chico State is to gather evidence from field-based studies um, to answer the question about whether population genetics is behind these differing rates of diversification. There are a couple of important differences between these two groups. Um, in all of them, all Tamelia aphids, there's always an alternation between walking, gall inhabiting, um, stages and then the aerial or winged dispersal stages, which I think I showed you in that life history summary a few slides ago. And it seems as though gall inducers are strictly limited to an alternating sequence of either walking or flying. But it looks like inquilines actually have a mixed strategy and females can produce both walking and flying kinds of offspring. So they're a little bit more fluid and seemingly they can respond more to local conditions. Here's a photo um, actually taken by my neighbor where I live in Chico here. Uh, and these are newly emerged adult winged aerial dispersing females having just climbed out of their gall early one morning. And he managed to get their little gossamer wings just as they were drying after they climbed out from their galls and had molted. Another way of moving or dispersing, um, especially among galls, I call it ambulatory or walking dispersing. And these are inquilines that were actually trapped in a substance called tanglefoot, sticky stuff that I applied to petioles of leaves supporting galls. I suspected that they did leave those galls probably at night and snuck around on the host plant seeking other galls to invade. So there are a few themes here um, regarding the kinds of exploitation that inquilines do with their gall inducing hosts. It appears that the gall inducers um, start these galls very quickly. And by so doing that, they can find relatively safe space from their natural enemies as well as inquilines once they're enclosed within those galls. So the pressure is on them to induce those galls quickly. It's also true gall inducers are effective at getting around aerially and finding new host plants quite readily. Even isolated manzanita shrubs in a forest can and will be colonized by these aphids. They're good at finding them. But I found through experimental evidence that inquilines actually withstand the attacks of predators and the hot desiccating sun better than the gall inducers. And this is consistent with their strategy of moving between galls and being exposed to predators and sunshine more than their gall-inducing hosts. 
I showed you earlier that I have evidence that inquilines outcompete gall inducers in reproductive output. I'm still working on this, the question of whether inquilines develop faster than their hosts for reasons I don't yet understand. I have a couple of, of experimental trials I wanna share with you. And the first one I call exit trials. And this concerns the relative modes of dispersal of inquilines and gall inducers. And I suppose that inquilines were sneaking around probably at night and more likely to be entangled in sticky stuff than gall inducers. To explore that, I carried out these experiments where I applied Tanglefoot on the leaf petiole supporting gall leaves. Now Tanglefoot is sticky stuff that's bad news for insects. Small animals uh, that get stuck in things uh, like resin or pitch or Tanglefoot, they don't get out again. I applied this stuff to study plants and followed it weekly. And then I collected the whole leaves and I looked under microscope carefully at the petioles, but I also opened up the gall contents to see what was inside and whether that gave a clue as to where the inquilines came from. And here are some results from these exit trials. I carried out 83 of these and I found that inquilines um, appeared in 19 of these trials. Now, the overall frequency of inquilines is again, only about 10% of the gall inducers. So inquilines were disproportionately more likely to show up in these sticky traps. I collected 82 of them total. A few of these trials did have inducers trapped, but they were in the minority. And so there's a highly significant association between the appearance of inquilines and the appearance of adult inquilines inside the galls from which those daughter inquilines presumably arose. And the other set of experimental trials I want to share with you, I call intergall dispersal trials. And here I was interested in trying to track these animals, which are very tiny. They're almost they're almost microscopic, half a, uh, half of a, a millimeter in length. And what I tried to do here was to use a laboratory tool called a pipetter to pull up fluorescent tracking powder. And then I actually would inject that or puff that into what I call a donor gall on the host plant. And then at some point later, I collected all neighboring galls, that is to say galls within a half meter of walking distance of the donor gall along the branches. So we have um, host galls and then we have the donor galls. And then I estimated the distance between donor galls and all host galls. And I collected finally all of the galls and looked for any evidence of aphid movement between the galls. Very tedious, <laughs> painstaking work took a lot of patience. I got some results, um, not as many as I wanted, but at least I have documentation that they do this. Here is actually a marked exuvium or shed exoskeleton of an inquiline in one of these host galls and it's pink. So the animal actually did make it to one of these galls and it did shed its skin. And that to me was solid evidence that they actually do this. And here's a table of the results of these intergall dispersal trials. Um, there were these several classes of distance between the recipient gall and the host gall. And these are the number of galls I examined. And all of the galls in which I found evidence for dispersal, and that's just 10 of them, were within this first uh, distance class, one to 10 centimeters. So not very far at all. I calculated the mean dispersal distance as 3.3 centimeters, not very far at all. And most of these were the nearest neighboring galls. So this seems to suggest that the inquilines do leave galls, but they go a very short distance and they tend to go to their nearest neighbor. Turning my attention now to aerial dispersal, colonization of host plants on a landscape, uh, you can't use the same tools for tracking that. Uh, various hypotheses uh, apply towards the question of which host plants are going to be colonized by winged aphids on a landscape during ecological succession. Uh, I'll mention a couple of them, but, but that's all I'm going to do here. The plant vigor and the plant stress hypothesis are two of these. The two I'm more interested in now are the apparency hypothesis, 
which essentially says that the larger or more obvious the plant, the larger a target is, it is, and the more likely it'll be colonized. And another one being the minimum dispersal distance hypothesis, suggesting that the closest plant is the most likely to be colonized. How do you track dispersal by flight? Well, the animals are very small. I cannot put uh, radar trackers on them, nothing like that. But when they show up on host plants and induce galls or their daughters do that, you can actually map those plants and you can come up with a pattern of colonization of plants over time. So some of the tools we've used for this are the Trimble Global Positioning System instrument. And there's a program called ArcGIS, Geographic Information System, which can be used for mapping the plants. And then you can actually test these ideas about nearest, um, shortest distance dispersal. I also have sampled the galls carefully over time to see what their contents are. I've carried out on an annual basis, and Jeff pointed this out, and thank you, Jeff, for helping. Um, annually in the fall, after the growing season, my ecology students have gone out and carried out what we call an annual gall census. Altogether, I have a pretty good um, detailed record of plants being colonized over time in this study area. <clears throat> now, here's a photo of one of these plants. And these are the young plants I'm studying because these are the ones that are only just supporting galls for the very first time. So we know their history. We know when galls show up. We know how many galls are on these plants. So again, during the growing season, I've um, collected galls from the plants and open them to see what the contents are to get a sense of the number of aphids within. After the growing season, again, the ecology students carry out a fall gall census, I call it. And this is a close up of dried galls after the growing season. This is what they look like on a young Archistaphylos visita. The nice thing about the galls is they stay there on the host plant and they can be counted, they can be measured even after the aphids are long gone. This is, gives you a sense of the distribution of plants in this study area here. I won't go into details. Um, suffice to say that there are areas where they're densely packed and they're younger plants, and there are other areas where the plants are not densely packed or they're only older plants. So the areas of the most interest to me are where the younger plants are, where there's active colonization and dispersal going on, like this area here, for example. Having followed these plants over some time and some years now, beginning in 2008, uh, if I look over the next 10 years, there are patterns that emerge. I call this cumulative colonization of these host plants, the young host plants, whose numbers have been reduced now to about 135. And the blue bars indicate the proportion of host plants that have been colonized by gall-inducing species, the Tamalia coeni, over time it's gradually increased and it's leveled off, approaching about 75% of them. But the inquilines in turn have also been colonizing the plants. Remember, they've got to find the host plant, but they've also got to find the host gall and invade that gall. So they too have been catching up and it looks as though they're starting to level off, but we don't know yet how exactly that's going to go. So they're pretty good at tracking their gall-inducing hosts. In fact, um, I estimated the lag between the first galls on plants and the first inquilines to be about two and three quarters years. But in 18 cases, um, both of these species were detected on the very first year. That is to say, inquilines showed up exactly when the gall inducing species showed up on the host plant. So they're pretty good at tracking them. Okay, some summary points here. I suppose that the life history strategy and mode of dispersal and small effective population sizes and inclines may accelerate the rate of evolution in that group thanks to genetic bottlenecks. So that's a hypothesis that I'm trying to explore. By doing these population censuses of galls and extrapolating from that the total population of these aphids, we may um, exposed dynamics of these populations that again throw light on the question of whether there are genetic bottlenecks going on. Altogether communal gall sharing it's fair to say 
enables or facilitates interspecific brood parasitism, also known as freeloading <laughs> in these Tamilia aphids. So the fact that females will happily shack up and share gall space opens the door, so to speak, to inquilines that can capitalize on it and exploit it. And that's my summary, my suns, I guess it's a sunset slide, isn't it? This is actually from the Granite Mountains Desert Research Center in, um, in the Mojave Desert. Beautiful place, I recommend. Just to thank my supporting um, organizations and the ecology students. And finally, to put in a plug, although now it's already out of date, which is horrible. Um, Chico State, we are hosting a plant gall symposium, international plant gall symposium. <laughs> it looks like it's going to be 2023. <laughs> Probably everybody knows why, because everything's getting delayed. But anyway, this is our, our logo, and everybody is welcome to come and attend um, the 8th International Plant Call Symposium in um, probably 2023. And that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> this is so weird. It's so weird. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Zoom yeah. stuff is bizarre. It's bizarre. Um, <laughs> it's bizarre. <laughs> you did a great <laughs> job, Don. Oh, he's got his class on. Yeah. You That's did a wild. great job. Thank you for thank your patience. That was fabulous. <laughs> so thank you so yeah. much. I don't, um, I, think I, I don't know if you saw in the chat, Don, but Jeff said he did doodle. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> This is like an admission. Not, not, doing your, not doing your lectures. Those are doing Chris's lectures. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a confession there. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but you never know. You uh, know. Yeah, you might be an artist. <laughs> you might even be a really good artist. I don't know. Yeah. We did have quite a few questions uh, yeah. coming through the chat kind of throughout um, and kind of all over the place, which is great. So the first question was, uh, and Alex and I think I'm going to kind of swap back and forth on going through some of the questions. But the first one was from Richard Marks, and it says, how do ladybugs and lacewings find aphids, like in your garden? Is it through pheromones or some other mechanism? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I'm not sure what mechanism they'll, they'll use if their uh, aphids are chemically um, very apparent. I'm guessing it's probably visual, visually done. For the most part, aphids, like many animals and other organisms, tend to occur in clusters or colonies, and aphids especially so, um, because, again, they reproduce clonally. So if you look at them on your, your roses or your tomatoes or such common things, you'll, if you look carefully before you squash them or blow them away with whatever, soapy water, you'll see that there are larger wingless um, individuals or females, and then there tend to be smaller ones. It's like, like a hen and chickens kind of an arrangement. So the daughters of the clone mates will often not go anywhere and they'll stick around their mom. So they represent a relatively larger target. I suppose ladybugs and lace wings can detect them chemically, but I'm not really sure about that. Um, there may be a chemical signature and they may sniff them out. So I'm not really sure. It's an interesting question. Thank you, Richard. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Okay, and then one question I had was, uh, you mentioned the soldier morphs are a bit different. Are, are they male or female? Could sexual dimorphism explain the difference in the two larvae type? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, bad news, guys. Uh, these are uh, feminine monarchies or all female societies. Uh, even more than that, they're clonal societies. So we're talking about animals that make copies of themselves. Um, so they're by definition, all of them are, are, are females, except that they're not functionally reproducing. They're just more copies of the same clone. Um, so in every case, uh, the soldierly morphs or soldiers actually are females, but they tend to be sterile females, especially those that are wholly adapted for attacking um, predators. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Roger asked, do the scroungers go in, uh, go in the gall at an opening or do they dig their way in? That's a cool question. 
so, so these animals have, I, I think I showed you a slide um, showing their mouth parts. If you remember, they look a little bit like oversized swords or sabers. And so they're part of an order called Hemiptera, the true bugs, and they make their living by sucking uh, plant or animal juices, in this case, phloem. So they actually can't really dig. Um, what they can do is stab and then suck, suck things. Um, so they actually cannot enter the gall by digging. They'll have to time it so the gall isn't yet closed. Now, initially the gall is the edge of a leaf and it's open, it's a, there's a window of opportunity and they have to hurry and get in there before it closes. Because once it closes, they really can't get in there. Neither can they get out. <laughs> Once they develop within the gall, they have to wait till the thing dries out. If it's induced correctly, it'll dry out and shrink. And then there'll be a little hole that allows the animals to leave. So they really cannot do any kind of digging. They, they, they have to time things correctly. So I just wanna jump in and add like an extension to that question. Do you have any evidence of or data showing are there times where the inquilines just kind of appear after the gall is closed and that like generation of inquilines just kind of dies off or what kind of happens in that case? Yeah, so, so I think this applies really to most of these insects and to most insects period is the vast majority of them don't survive. They don't make it. Um, females tend to be highly fecund and produce a lot of offspring. Vast majority of them just failing to survive. So I think most inquilines um, that climbing are, are climbing around looking for entry into galls don't make it. And only a minority of them actually manage to make it. Now, because we have a single genotype or a clone that's making copies of itself, you could think of that as a kind of risk spreading or a bet hedging strategy. If you have many copies of yourself essentially and you spread them over a landscape, chances are at least some of them may survive. Um, but certainly they don't, all, they don't all survive. So this is one, I think of this as a fairly clever kind of aphid strategy um, for, for surviving. <laughs> no um, another question from Eden. Uh, why are there galls with only ink lines at all? Did they kill off all the hostesses? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I didn't want to dwell on it too much. They do not, they do not fight or kill their hosts. Um, instead, they may just, uh, simply the hosts may have died and the inquilines were the only ones remaining. The inquilines are tougher. I've explored this experimentally by <clears throat> baking them in an oven. That doesn't sound very nice, but not really baking them, but just 40 degrees centigrade, like 104 uh, um, Fahrenheit. And they are much tougher and much more resistant to high temperatures and low humidities than their hosts. So I think they can withstand um, extreme drought um, and heat in an old gall, even if their hosts have long since died. And that could, could explain that, that strange result. And the follow-up question to that, uh, also from, I, don't, yeah, I apologize if it's Aiden or Eden, uh, is what's the population size for some of those graphs, say the ratios of inquilines to hostesses? Yeah, the overall average across years, we're talking about years, um, tends to be about a one out of every 10 galls having an inquiline in it. Uh, so people sometimes wonder, well, why aren't there more inquilines? It's hard to say what keeps them in balance, but I think the odds are mostly stacked against them. Nevertheless, on average, about 10% of, 10 of them manage to hang on um, and survive and reproduce. And the population size at my study area, which is what ecology students um, help me estimate, uh, runs into probably the tens of thousands. So it's actually not really enormous. Um, but again, probably everybody in this audience has seen shrubs covered, festooned with lots and lots of galls on them. So you might have one plant. I think the number, the biggest number of galls I ever counted on a plant was 1,175. And that was exhausting. Um, other plants will have zero. The ones right next door may have zero. So this massive uh, variance in how many galls a plant has I suppose it has something to do with insect plant um, genetic interactions of some kind. Are you, are you counting those all individually or estimating in clumps? No, I'm counting them. This is maybe I'm crazy, but I count them individually. 
So the truth of the matter is, I, this ecology students, bless their hearts, go out and count the galls and measure the plants. Um, but because I'm, I'm a son of a pup, I go back there and I count every single one of those plants to satisfy myself. Um, and then some of the students, like Jeff, actually get the numbers really close. And so I figure, okay, they're, they're pretty good. And others, I'm not sure what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, I think the valuable lesson is they get involved in research, long-term research. Um, and it's really true that the height and width measurements of the plants are, are useful and they're quite reliable. So I do use the data. So my, my I actually had a follow-up question to the uh, population ratio question. Um, is that it, it seems to me like uh, the inclines are dependent on the gall inducers to build the house and then they move in and live in the house. Uh, but at the same time, if the inclines kind of outcompete the gall inducers, which you showed through the graph where you said that the inclines have higher fitness, they have higher offspring rates. Um, is there almost selection more for inclines when they're being successful? Um, and then if that's the case, do you almost start to get this kind of back and forth, like the moose and the wolf, you know, classic predator prey dynamic mm -hmm. thing where do inclines start to outcompete the gall inducers? And then if, if that happened, do the inclines then start to kind of decline until the gall inducers come back? Do you start to see that wave of like crossing populations? Yeah, this is a really interesting question too, because I mean, I, I suppose you're referring to the um, Canadian lynx, the Canada lynx, sorry, and, and then the, the snowshoe hare, those famous um, population cycles going back over a hundred years in the Hudson Bay Fur Company. And the short answer is it does appear that there's massive changes from year to year of the frequency or commonness of inquilines in these galls. Um, some years they're quite rare, other years they're relatively common. And your suspicion might be correct um, that there's some kind of self-correcting process overall such that the inquiline numbers tend to stabilize on average at around 10% of the galls, but it really varies a whole lot. And I suspect that these big swings, the bigger swings in the inquiline populations are consistent with a genetic bottleneck hypothesis in which their uh, genetics are gonna be changing faster and that'll accelerate their rate of evolution. So I, I think you're onto something. Um, I've gotta get more, probably have to get more long-term data to really have a, a powerful story there. Cool. All right, and maybe final question of the evening. Um, what's the current thinking about the evolutionary relationship between the gall inducer and the inquiline you said was closely related? Did the inquiline just give up making galls one day and become a new species? Oh, this is really tempting, like just quit working and I'm just gonna shack up with my cousin. And yeah, I, I like that. That's a really interesting question. Uh, and it is difficult to pinpoint a mechanism um, behind the loss of the ability to induce a gall or just the failure to induce galls, just stop doing it and let the relatives do it for you. Hey, that's a pretty good deal. Um, it does appear as though the inquilines arose initially in conjunction with a host plant shift. Um, that is to say that the earliest lineages of this group depended on Arbutus, um, not Pacific Madrone, interestingly, but Arizona madrone and Mexican madrone. And then in conjunction, apparently, um, with timing and colonization of this new genus, Arctostaphylos, we all know and love manzanitas, inquilines appeared. So inquilines are restricted to Arctostaphylos only. It's as if they showed up after this whole group began to exploit Arctostaphylos. So there's something probably about the ecology of Arctostaphylos um, that, uh, enable the inquilines to exploit the gall inducers. But I don't have a, it's very hard to say, you know, this is the reason. I do know though, that there's a relationship between um, the exploitative ability of the inquilines and um, their relative high rate of growth within the galls. It's almost as if by giving up the ability to induce a gall, they're better at out competing them, out reproducing, and outgrowing their hosts. It's almost like there's a trade-off. And so another body of research I'm entering now is looking at genomic analysis, patterns of gene expression to see if there are any associations between the ability to induce a gall and the loss of the ability to induce a gall that are associated with functional groups and genes. 
So thank you for that question. That's a pretty deep question. 